All right, I'm gonna take it away. Hello all, and welcome to Cooking with David. My name is Mandy Lyon, and I'm serving as this year's president of the Parents Association. We are so fortunate to have David Jansen, parent and husband of beloved alumni and current teacher, Debbie Grass Jansen, here tonight. David will attempt to teach us how to make one of France's signature dishes, beef bourguignon. He was the former executive chef at the posh Four Seasons Fountain Room, is now the chef and owner of Jansen, the upscale American contemporary restaurant in Mount Airy. Deb will be by his side as sous chef tonight. Tonight's SCH Connects event is brought to you by the Alumni Association. Our panelists include Katie Schreiner, president of the Springside Alumni Association class of 1995, her husband, Todd, and other notable alumni and SCH parents. They'll introduce themselves as we go along. Thank you so much for agreeing to put it all out there alongside David and Deb. The SCH Development Office will also be making a lot of attempts. Good luck, guys. <laughs> if you do have any questions, folks, just please use the chat and they'll answer them as best they can. So without further ado, I give you Master Chef David Jansen. Have fun, everybody. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have to say that I've been a member of the SCH community for the last uh, 20 years. Um, the support that has uh, gone out to my restaurant um, from the faculty, from the staff, and from the, the parents of SCH has been heartwarming during this very difficult time for the restaurant. Uh, and it's, it's much appreciated. Um, like uh, it was said, I was the fountain, uh, fountain restaurant chef for 22 years. I started as a co not getting paid, and I worked every position until I was finally the executive chef. Um, I spent uh, time cooking with some of the best chefs in the world, um, Paul Bacuse, Rene Vergez, Thomas Keller. Um, my restaurant was rated in the top 10 in North America. It was a five-dining, five-star restaurant. Um, I stepped aside from it, and I opened up Jansen. And I want to thank each and every one of you for your support and for coming in and uh, enjoying the food, I hope. And tonight, you know, last week when I thought about what I would do or two weeks ago, I thought, well, it's going to be cold and rainy outside. It's going to be, you know, chilly, freezing. People are going to want to have a, something hearty and stewy. I didn't realize it was going to be 75 degrees today. <laughs> so that being said, with my producer and sous chef beside me, I will answer all questions. Um, the one thing I will say is when we start this, you guys received a recipe. The one thing I was always taught, I started working when I was 14 years of age, a recipe is a guideline. What you want to do is you want to take that guideline and make it yours. If you don't like carrots, you don't have to have carrots in it. If you're not kind of shy about garlic, you don't have to put that much garlic in it or no garlic at all. So we're going to cook this through and we're going to talk about it. And I'm going to use, of course, Julia Child's recipe um, because it's a good standard recipe. But like I said, I'm going to be teaching you things that will make it quicker, a little bit easier, less of a cleanup, and hopefully one pot. And that's it. Um, I was fortunate enough to cook with uh, Julia Child about 20 years ago, and she was an outstanding, outstanding chef. Uh, sweet beyond belief but just she captured a room as soon as she walked in. So one of the things I thought about, cold, rainy, but also mm -hmm. something that I could definitely impart that this is a home style cooking stew, okay? So if you have questions, please just put them out there. I'm willing to talk about anything in the whole world. If you have questions about knives, if you have questions about setups, about cookware, about anything, I'm here to help and answer all questions, okay? <laughs> Uh-oh, someone can't see anything. That's not good. Okay, so if, if you, um, uh, in the chat, I think someone said they can't see, you have to do it on your computer it, on the top right-hand corner where it says view, you can adjust the way that you see us. Speaker view. Speaker view. And you wanna do it on speaker view? That would help you to be able to see everybody. Speaker view? We can't see everybody. 
Okay, so the first thing that we're going to start mm -hmm. doing is we're going to uh, I'm going to do a couple of knife skills and uh, and how to use a knife properly, so that way you don't end up cutting off your your finger uh, and bleeding all over the place. The first thing is when you do a cutting board. Okay, a lot of people don't realize that you just put down a cutting board and you're fine. The one thing that will make it safer and a lot easier to do is a wet towel underneath your cutting board. So that way. It doesn't move, it doesn't slide, it doesn't move around. If you don't do that and, and it slides around, you have okay. a tendency that the, the nuts will split. The other thing is work with one vegetable at a time. So I know that there's no leeks in the recipe that I gave you, but I love leeks and the French love leeks. So this is a leek, okay? It's a considered part of the onion family. And what I did was I sliced it in half. So that way it's a flat surface. When you're cutting something that's round, you want to cut it so that way it stabilizes on the cutting board, okay? Whether it's an onion, whether it's a pumpkin, whether it's a leek. So at that point, a lot of people don't realize, but and I hope you can see this, but the thing is you want to curve your fingers when you're cutting. So that way the knife is against the finger, but your fingers are toned down so that they're away from the knife. If you're like this and your fingers are out, that's when you have a tendency to cut. And that's where problems come. So, okay, hold on a second, hold on. Um, I think part of the problem is that all the panelists are not muted. And so it's hard for people to hear. I, I, I see that repeated. So if everyone could mute, that would be amazing, please. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start with uh, some leeks, some onions, some garlic, um, and then we'll go in with the celery. Um, when it comes to the French cooking, it's, uh, you have a standard of vegetables that go just about every single thing, and it's called mirepoix. So it's onion, celery, carrot, leek, and garlic. So what we're going to do is we're going to just start by just doing a nice dice. But the thing is, when you're doing something like a stew, you want the veg and the meat and everything to be about the same size. Because if you cut something that's really small, then that's going to cook extremely quickly. And what happens is that's going to turn into mush and the rest of the veg is going to be underdone. So when you're cutting things, make it uniform. Make sure that it's all perfect size, that it's all uh, the same size. As you can see, those leeks right here, nice, nice large dice. Do you want to reiterate because someone just said leeks weren't on the recipe. So I know. Uh, I'm sorry. If, if you guys just tuned in, the thing is, what I said at the very beginning is uh, when it comes down to recipes, um, use it as a guideline. Um, if you like something, uh, add, add it to it. It's fine. Majority of the time, if you like extra potatoes, add more potatoes. Use it as a guideline. Don't use it as, oh, this is how strict it has to be. Um, some people like peas and beef bourguignon. Some people like turnips. I like turnips, so we're going to put some turnips in. But so, But you don't have to. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. The veg that you have from the recipe is just fine. So we're gonna go from there. So the leeks are cut, then we're gonna take an onion. Take the onion, like I said, we're gonna cut it in half because we want that flat, stable surface. Then what we're gonna do is do a nice dice and it's gonna be about the same as what it is for what I just did with the leek, okay? Um, the second thing is, as you become more comfortable with your knife skills and, and how you're cooking, it's gonna be easier and it's gonna be faster. So it'll become a lot more efficient as you get to use your knife. And one thing is make sure your knife is super sharp. Mm -hmm. The thing that happens with most novice cooks is that their knife is not sharp and they think, oh, well that makes it safer. No, what makes it more dangerous is having a dull knife because it slips off the vegetable and it goes where? Right into your hand. So as I'm cutting this and talking, um, I'm trying one thing, I work with one vegetable at a time. So that way the board is not cluttered. If you got 10 million things on your board when you're cooking, that's when accidents occur too. Do one at a time, cut it, put it into the next container. The thing is, I was always told uh, by Jean-Marie Lacroix that, hey, listen, if you cook in merde, you're gonna end up with merde. And merde is shit. Okay. No, oh, sorry, sorry. So the onions are going to be cut. And then the rest of the veg that I'm going to do, 
Of course, a classic bourguignon has the, uh, the cremini mushrooms or the small little button mushrooms, and it also has the pearl onions. But I like to add a little bit of potato to it. I like a little bit of celery. If you can see right here, I have uh, multicolored carrots, which I love. The little baby potatoes that really add like a little bit of starch and a little bit of uh, thickening agent to it. And of course, celery, a basic, and then the button mushrooms. And then the pearl onions. Now I cheated. The thing is, when you become better and you start to realize that you don't want to have 12,000 pots and pans to clean up, what you want to do is you want to do mise en place to begin with. So what I did with these pearl onions, I peeled them, just tossed them with olive oil, salt, and pepper, put a little aluminum foil onto a pan, and roasted them in the oven. 425, 10 minutes. Do you want to explain what mise en place is? Maybe not everyone knows. Oh, mise en place. Mise en place is everything in its proper place and order. That means that you're going through the recipe, you have all of your mise en place, your items set and ready to go. So um, you're not running around going, oh God, I don't know where my flour is. So if you're looking at my mise en place here, it's everything I need to make the dish, which is the most important thing. I'm showing. Oh, sure. Okay, so all this is there. So that way when you start cooking, and especially when it's one pot, and you're doing it all in one pot, it makes it so much more essential instead of going, oh God, I forgot this. Oh, I don't have that. If you have it all together right in front of you, one is cleanup's easier. You throw it in, you put it right in the dishwasher and you're set and ready to go. The one thing is when I first started cooking, my mother was just like, you know, you're a very talented young man, but you are one messy, messy boy. <laughs> and I would sit there and I, I would work on it because if you're working where it's not clean, not organized, and you don't have your stuff together, you're not going to be a very good chef, and you're not going to be a very good cook. And it makes it harder. It makes it more stressful. So things that you can do ahead of time, there's nothing wrong with it. They're called shortcuts. Did you already cook the potatoes? Did I what? Already cooked the potatoes. No, I did not cook the potatoes, but they're so small that these are going to be able to cook in by the time the stew's done. Remember, we're going to be cooking this for about two hours at a low temperature. Um, the bigger the pieces of beef that you have, I know that Julia at, does like a two inch cut to it, but I did about a cut that was probably about an, an inch, okay? Because I figured I wanna eat tonight before 10 o'clock and I'm starved. But so that's getting our mise en place set. So I just sliced a little bit of garlic I'm going to take some turnips and once again, they're round. So what am I going to do? I'm going to cut them and then I'm going to make sure it's flat against the cutting board. And then I'm going to cut it down. I like turnips to this because it actually adds a little bit of earthiness, a little bit of sweetness to it. And I know most people are like, oh, turnips, but turnips are divine in this. It's, can you use a baking potato? Yeah, sure, sure. You can use baking potatoes. You can use uh, red bliss. Uh, Yukon gold potatoes are really good in this because they have, uh, you know, in Idaho is kind of like a dry baking potato. It's great for roasting and, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, a Yukon gold potato has more water and moisture to it. So it actually really like becomes buttery when you cook it down in this. These little baby whites, uh, they become like little sugar sweetness to it. And, and it's a perfect amount of starch to it. So I'm going to take the turnip and I'm going to add that. And that's going to be the last bit. Um, the beef that I'm using tonight, um, I know that brisket, can, uh, a lot of people are using brisket tonight. Uh, you don't have to do just brisket. You can also do uh, beef cheeks, which are absolutely phenomenal. You could do a top round. You could do a pot roast. You can do any type of braising meat that, that has uh, a good amount of fat to it, but it also is uh, low and slow cooking. When I say that, I'm saying 325. So after we get it all finished and roasted and we start working with the wine and adding all the vegetables to it and getting good color to it, the last stage of it is two different ways. You can pop it in the oven at 325 and, and let it just go slow for two hours until you taste the meat until it's tender. Or you can put it up on your stove and let it go slow that way. But it's up to you. 
I always like put it into the stove because guess what? I love the smell of it. I love the, I, I don't have to stir it. <laughs> I don't have to, it's like you just throw it in there and it's done, okay? So, like I said, the beef that I'm using is uh, actually called a four shank. Um, it is uh, the top shoulder. So you'll see I've got a bone with a marrow in it, okay? Uh, that bone marrow, after it's done cooking, will become nice and, and liquefied, and you actually smear that on bread, and it's phenomenal. Um, when it comes down to beef bourguignon, everybody says, what should I serve with it? What should I, you know, as an accouchement? Um, it, traditionally in France, you're doing like a, a, a garlic crouton, and you're just baking that in the oven, but potato puree or mashed potatoes. Um, pasta is also another good thing. Um, there are many things, uh, just like I said, it could be up to your taste. You could do polenta, you could do mashed potatoes, you can do you know, uh, roasted potatoes. It goes with just about everything. And the great thing about this is um, it's really great to just uh, freeze. I mean, you could freeze it and then have it again in a month. And the one thing great about stews, uh, as you cook it and as it continues to cook, uh, and the next day, I think Thank it's you. even better. What's going on? They're saying I'm a good assistant. So. Oh, <laughs> best saucier and sous chef I ever had. Okay, we're going to head over to the stove. We're going to start rocking. All right. 720, all right? I'm going to hope to have this all done by 8 o'clock. Um, that way you guys can eat by 8.30 or 10 o'clock and, and we'll be set. <laughs> okay. Hey, so, David, can, David, can I ask you one question? You talked about slicing the garlic. I had already minced it. Does it matter? Minced no, it doesn't garlic matter. Slice? The thing is, uh, I like to slice it because when you actually uh, chop it fine, then you should be doing that real quick. It should, it, it, you have to make sure that it doesn't burn. That's the big thing. If you, if, if you chop it fine, it's a lot of surface area and it has a tendency to burn very quickly. Okay. So is everybody good at this point? What pot do we use? Ah. And please do not say, say please say what kind of pot is this? Like a stock pot. Dutch oven, yeah. stock pot. Okay, the one thing that you want is you want to have something with uh, uh, a hearty bottom. Okay, because if you're going to keep it on the stove, then uh, you're going to have to have that to make sure that it doesn't burn. Okay, now, that, 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 yeah, it's you. It's you. <laughs> and she gets a mute. <laughs> You know, David, we, the development office, we are really trying. We're trying over here. We're really trying. You guys are doing it. I want to see I some mean, reaction. I want to see some cooking. You got the, the right pots the back thing there. Is, David, which I think other people want to say is that you have added things that other yeah. people, that we didn't have on our potatoes, ingredient list. Potatoes, uh, all this stuff. We, and we, we really are in awe of your chopping skills because we, <laughs> the, you have gone like this and we yes, were, very, very, <laughs> we're like that. Well, so, those onions look absolutely fantastic. Who cut oh. them? <laughs> Very nicely done. Someone and asked, what do you do with the bacon? I'm going to say you eat it, but I, I'm going to let you answer that, David. <laughs> okay. uh, the one thing is, whenever bacon is cooked in the kitchen, you have to hide it. Because everybody that walks yep. by is just like, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Nobody can say no to the bacon. All we're right. Going over. So we're going to come on over. Now... One of the things, we're going to click this on. You have on. to tell me. You have to tell me. What do you see? What's that? Is this right? I don't see anything. Oh, do you guys see anything at this point? I see nothing. And then David, someone asked, can you put all clad in the oven? Oh, yeah, very much so. I love all clad. And that's the thing, too. You don't really, I can't see me because I'm seeing them. I don't see me. Do you see you up in the top corner? Oh, yeah, good. Everybody see that? Everybody's okay with that? Everybody can see the pan? Good. Okay. So what we're going to do, the very first part of it, first off, we're going to click the fan on, which is the most horrible thing in the whole world. Yeah, because it's going to be like... I know. Okay. Okay, so we're going to get this nice and hot. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take our meat. Now, I've seasoned this with salt and cracked pepper. And I did it about an hour ahead, so that way it really gets in to the meat. But don't panic if you don't do that. But don't panic if you didn't do it. Thank you. Thank you, sous chef. <laughs> okay. Thank you, chef de cuisine. All right. Okay. So we're going to get this hot. Um, the one thing I want everybody to do 
you. David, someone asked, how much oil did you use? Uh, I would probably say about a tablespoon, two tablespoons. The, you want it to be enough to cover the bottom of the pan, okay? And the big thing is when you're cooking, I want you to take your time. The thing is people rush cooking and I was always taught good cooking takes time. So you want to make sure that you get a good smoke coming off of that. And you want to make sure that when you're sauteing something, you just let it sit. You have a tendency, you're like always thinking, oh my God, it's going to burn. Oh my God, I got I to gotta turn it. But guess what? When you turn it and it doesn't have that color, you'll never get that color back because you've, you've uh, cooled down the pan and you've lost that initial heat. One of the first chefs I worked with was a, uh, a Swiss trained Austrian gentleman. I was 14 years of age. I, I finally made it to saute by the time I was 16. And I was so excited about sauteing a piece of meat for the first time. And he was a tall Austrian, about six foot five with a toque that made him look like he was about 12 feet. A toque is the, the, the chef's hat. And uh, I put a steak into a pan and I didn't know he was behind me. He slapped me so hard, my head almost went into the pan. And he said, you're not sauteing, you're boiling. I never forgot it. Now. So David, I'm sorry, cooking for dummies panelist here. So what do you put the, the stove to? You put it to medium, medium high? No, you want to crank it high. high. You want to get it real, real hot. Because the thing is, when you're sauteing a piece of fish, a piece of meat, you want to get that good smoke going, but you want to be on real high because as soon as you put the protein in there, the protein is automatically going to take that surface temperature down. Okay. So you want to get that good smoke. You'll see it is starting to come up right now, but you'll see that smoke rising. And as long as you, you've got an excellent hood there, you'll be fine. Okay. So we'll, we're going to continue to let that go until it's really, really hot. And then we're going to start. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to, and like I said, I know that you're going to say the recipe doesn't say this. The recipe doesn't say that. What I'm teaching you is the same basic technique, but we're bringing it into 2020. Oh, sorry, I keep moving it. It's okay. We're taking it to 2020 where we don't have 12,000 pots. We don't have 12,000 pans. We're doing it in one pot, but we're still coming up with a really great ingredient and a great product. Okay. Because Otherwise, you know, Julia does, you know, she blanches the bacon first and then she renders, and then I'm gonna show you this technique that's all in one shot, okay? So you see the smoke that's coming up? See that, nice and hot? Okay, so when you put it in, and the one thing about cooking too is, you know, especially now is food safety. You'll see I'm wearing gloves. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when they wake up one morning and they go, oh, I think I have the flu. A lot of times it's because they have three born illness because they're cutting bacon on a cutting board that they just cut onions with, or they're touching raw meat and then touching raw vegetables. Three David, the illness. development office has a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Kristen, what's the question? Our meat is splattering. Our, ours is splashing around, and uh, we don't have the gloves. And is it Sorry, I didn't hear you. Our meat is splashing. We put ours in the pot, and it is <laughs> boom. I mean, oh, yeah. it's splattering. Oh, yeah. it's, it, it should be splattering all over the place. Uh, okay. you can, you can I get just got my hair done, though. I don't want to get that oil in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you know what they say. If you can't stand the heat, you got to get out of the kitchen. <laughs> That's why I'm over here and my sous chefs are back here behind me preparing. <laughs> okay, so we're not gonna overcrowd the pan. We're gonna put in our beef, so that way it's staying. Uh, can you get a little closer, Jeff? Okay, so it's just enough to co cover the bottom, okay? You don't wanna throw it all in at one time because it'll bring down the temperature of your pan. But, and then, you know what you're gonna do? You're just gonna let it sit. You're gonna pour yourself another glass of wine. And during that time, you're gonna let that good caramelization, it's, it's what I spoke about earlier. If you move it too quickly, you're never gonna get good color. So at this point, you're thinking, oh, it's gonna burn, it's gonna burn. No, just relax. Good cooking takes time. Sip a glass of wine. And now, of course, the wine, let's talk about that. 
okay? So we're gonna use what? A burgundy, why? It's from Bourgogne. So we're gonna do a nice, uh, I've got a, a good kind of cheaper Louis Jadot, which is a Bourgogne from, uh, but all burgundy wines, all the reds, they're famous for Pinot Noir. As you go down to Bordeaux, down the, the wine region, you go through Burgundy, well, you go through Champagne, Epernay, through Chablis, and then you go down to Burgundy, and then you end up in Bordeaux. Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? So Burgundies are all Pinots. And then, of course, you have great uh, 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 Chardonnays from there also. But when you're cooking with something, everybody says, well, what wine should I do with it? It's called an affinity pairing. An affinity pairing is using wine that comes from that region, and it's used in the cooking. It's 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 the terroir, the whole basic area of where it is from. So, you know, the land, the wind, the sun, the temperature, everything affects the wine, which affects the animals that graze there, which also affects the veg, which is prevalent there. So it all kind of works well together as a team. David, do we keep the meat on high after we have it in the pan? Yes. Keep it going. Here. And then someone asked in the chat, do you do the meat in stages so you don't crowd the pan? Yes. Just toss really it all nice. Who is that? Who said that? Well, whoever, it, said that wh it, whoever, whoever said that, they're right on. So we're going to do this in two batches. Uh -oh. so the first batch, as soon as I am ready to stir it. <laughs> What if we're doing it in two pans? Does that count? Because we just put all ours in. No, that's fine. If you want to rock it and do two pans, that's great. And okay. listen, you don't have to use this pot, too. You can also use two saute pans, saute your meat real quick, and then add that, you know, drain that meat and put it back into the pan and then start the process where I'll show you. Because we're going to take the beef out after it's sauteed. You hear that sizzling? You hear that crispness? And you see that brown color, what you're starting to develop is a thing called a font. The font is those little bristles, but those little bristles add so much flavor to everything. So we're going to take this out. I'm going to add a little bit more oil to it again, and then we're going to do that second batch. And like I said, uh, I'm, you can do it in three different pans. You can do this all in, in saute pans and then put it into, you know, just a cooking dish and do it that way inside the oven. What do you think, Jack? Is that good? My dogs are loving this cooking demonstration. All they smell is the beef. Oh yeah, they probably just, okay. Well, I cooked it once today already, so. I think that they, but you already they, cooked it once today. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, through the uh, incredible uh, uh, of television, I have one in the oven right now, which we'll pull out at the end. So that way, the can, development office just wants to be clear in case ours doesn't come out, we could come right over. Yes, exactly. Yes. I'll bring leftovers tomorrow. Okay, all righty, all righty. Okay, so once again, good cooking takes time. You took that out, you got good caramelization on that, but you want it to be hot again. You want it to continue to get the smoke up. Get that nice and hot again because you cooled it down once you threw the meat in. Now we're gonna do the second batch. <gasps> when you throw it in, you'll know because you'll hear that sizzle. Do you hear that sizzle? David, I'm gonna check in with everybody else. Yolanda and um, Katie, how are you guys all doing? Goofies? How's everybody else doing with theirs? Sorry, uh, it's all, it, I'm so happy that it's, it's the both of us working in this kitchen because um, looks like my husband's doing all the work <laughs> and I'm helping just open up the wine. That's, that's an important job. That's an important part. <laughs> So Billy Harris, awesome. Billy Harris, are you helping your mom in there? No. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like Lucy and Ethel cooking in the kitchen. But it's <laughs> Billy and Pam. Family dynamics so, <laughs> so, so, so not here. Awesome you put in the pot. Okay, you want to say that? How are you doing in there? Mel and Deck, how are you all doing? Salt and pepper. 
Oh, wait, let me unmute you too. Now, we've got the beef in. We're sauteing that a second time, that second batch. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing okay? I hope. We're good. We're good. Yeah. Okay. David, when you took your meat out of the, the bowl, did you just put it on a pan of just like yes. a long pan? Yeah, because that's going to go right back in. Okay. As soon as, after we get this second batch of uh, the beef out, we're going to get that pan hot again, and we're going to add our mushrooms to it and saute our mushrooms. And as the mushrooms start to crisp, we're going to add our bacon to it. Okay? Add the bacon. <laughs> No, something about loving bacon. Yeah. Do you have a piece? Where are you going? I know you're hungry. Can you see that in there? Oh. Yes, I definitely. I want to try not to grab the bacon. Have we added bacon yet? No. Mm -mm. no. We're just sauteing the meat. Okay, that's fine. Right. Okay. And then we're going to add our mushrooms to it and saute our mushrooms and then our bacon. And then we'll cook that down and then all our vegetables. Okay. Okay. David, yeah. Important question. We've got a very, very important, important question in the chat, David. A very what? A very important, important question in the chat. Go ahead. Said, isn't it easier just to order the beef short ribs entree from Jansen? Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do the cooking. I'm telling you. Thank you, Jane. We do a great short rib with a cheddar cheese grits and uh, and. Uh, thank you, thank uh, you, Jane. <laughs> okay, so we're sauteing that up. We're okay because we don't have mushrooms to go. Right. Okay. So I think that's probably good. Is it good? Yeah. Now, there's going to be some Dave, are we are we frying the bacon? No, I'll show you. That's okay. going to be the next component. Now, the thing is, there's going to be some fat in this. But <laughs> with the fat, we're going to add a little bit of flour to it after we do our vegetables. So what's going to happen is you're kind of making like a roux. It's going to help for thickening. It's going to take all the fat out of it. It's going to make it a lot uh, easier to uh, kind of bring together as a thick sauce. And the one thing I want to tell you is you'd rather add something that thickens it too much than too little, because if you, it's easier to thin something out than it is to thicken it. And that goes with everything. That goes with uh, soups. Like say you're doing a simple carrot soup. You add carrots, you add chicken stock, you add heavy cream. Um, if you add too much chicken stock and too much heavy cream, you're going to end up with a very thin soup and you'll never get that thickness back. But you can always take a little bit of chicken stock after you've cooked it and go, oh, wait a second, I can add a little bit of chicken stock and boom, you're not having to worry about having to thicken it again. Okay, so we're at this point. It's bubbling, it's splattered all over the place. Take our mushrooms. Throw right in there, okay? We're gonna add a little bit of olive oil to it. Because what's gonna happen is mushrooms suck up all the oil. Um, when you throw a mushroom into a pan, if you're sauteing it, you'll notice that all the oil comes out of it. But we're gonna put it on the bottom and then let that cook. And once again, it's just waiting, it's patience. You know, sit there. And I like to do this because I'll walk around, I'll watch football, I'll see what's on, you know, if baseball's on or, you know, anything. And I'll tell you what, you walk, you come back, it's nice and golden brown. It's all about timing. It's all about, hey, 
I know it takes me five minutes to saute mushrooms and get a good caramelization on it. So that five minutes, you can be doing something, you know. <laughs> I'm looking at my producer. She's going, more time, more time. All right, so come on back in. Keep it moving, Deb. Tell them to keep it moving. Keep it moving. Yeah. Yep. Keep now, you see, it's starting to get a good brown on the mushrooms. Okay? You see that? And it picked up all those meaty scraps on the bottom. Right? Okay. Here it is. Bacon. Bacon's going in. Okay? Now, I like a good thick slab bacon. Okay? But what's going to happen is... We're going to take our time. We're going to render this out. And the mushrooms are going to continue to brown, but then the bacon's going to render. Now, make sure you, this is the one time when you move it all around because it's all stuck together. But as soon as you get the bacon all broken up like that, you want to just let it sit and then start to get your render on. Right, Deb? Yes. Mm -hmm. Not yet, yes. I said yes. <laughs> and if you notice, I have not touched the, the heat. It is on high. It will stay on high. Because as we add more vegetables to it, then what happens is it cools it down again. And then you need to keep cooking it again. So that way you start breaking down the veg. So we're going to let that continue on high. We're going to spread it out so it covers the bottom all the way, nice and flat, and then we'll go on to the next. I have three dogs at my feet, all <laughs> begging for bacon and beef. <laughs> Joan Chester. Joan. <laughs> They're my real sous chefs. Focus right on. That. I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 So now that bacon's starting to render down, you've got some good fat in there. And, you know, some people will take that fat and pour it off, but we got more veg to go in. So with our onion and our garlic, the first thing that's going to take the most amount of time, we want to get a good sweat on the onion and garlic. A little bit of leek, a little bit of onion. Now, you'll notice it's all cut about the same size. Like I said, the cooking process, you don't want something to be too small. You don't want something to be too big. So we're going to let this sit. Too big. My father was a big rutabaga man. Not too many people even know what a rutabaga is anymore. So come on in close. Now you're taking all that fat from the bacon, from the beef, and you're using that to saute this veg. Now, if you have a large saute pan, this will take less time. But like I said, I like to work with one pot, one pot only.
and you can still hear the, the veg is cooking well. It's starting to break down a little bit and it's starting to, uh, you know, you can still hear that sizzle. So you still- David, have good heat. David are yeah. you still on high heat? Yes, that's what I'm okay. saying. You can keep that on high because as soon as you put veg into it, it's gonna cool it down. But you can still hear it sizzling. It's still crackling. So you wanna keep it on high. And this is a time when, keep it on high because as you add more veg to it, it's gonna cool your pot down. So you want it to be as high as possible so that way you can continue to cook it and break down the veg. And what this is called, it's called, you're, you're trying to get the veg to be translucent. The onion and garlic should be cooked all the way, but you're also gonna be cooking this, like I said, for two hours. So you're in pretty good shape. Now I see how you're going back and forth. Grab that, grab your, uh, grab your, uh, your tray, bring it right next to the oven. So that way you're not going back and forth. Bring all your misopause closer to the station. So that way you can go pop, 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 instead of going back and forth. The one thing is at the uh, hotel, I had 80 cooks underneath me. And the thing was, I said, this will always move faster than your feet. So what you want to do is get your, and when I talk about misopause, getting it all next to the stove. So that way you're cutting out that, that back and forth, back and forth. Have it right there. Exactly. It's good dancing. <laughs> okay, bring it in tight. So now you've seen it's starting to break down. It's starting to really get, uh, you know, the color of the veg is starting to come out in it. Okay. And like I said, no matter what veg you have, you know, you're still following the same procedures. You're still going to, if you don't have the potatoes, if you don't have the celery, if you don't have anything like that, it's fine. So we're going to let that sit to get real hot one more time. And then we're going to add a little flour to it. Now, when it comes down to it, I know a lot of people are gluten free. They don't want to add flour. They don't want to add, there's other ways you can do it. The one way you could do it is the natural starch of potatoes will help thicken it. Okay. The other way that you can do it, you could do it with a little bit of cornstarch and water, which is called a slurry. And you can add that at the very end to thicken it. There's also uh, arrowroot, which is another kind of like thickening agent. But at this point, um, even with just the potatoes, it won't be as thick, but you'll still have some good consistency because of the starch coming out in the potato, okay? So at this point, we're gonna let it get real hot and then we're gonna start adding our flour. Now, this is just like grandma used to do with her turkey. This is something that was very, very popular in France and it was called a roux, okay? But a classic roux is equal parts butter and equal parts flour. Now, we've got all this fat, so we don't need the butter. We've got the bacon fat, we've got the olive oil, we've got the beef fat, so we're gonna use that instead of butter. So we're gonna add our flour to it until it totally glazes and it totally sucks up all that fat that's in there, okay? Like I said, you would rather have it too thick than too thin. Because if it's too thick, you can always add a little bit of stock to it to lessen and loosen it up. But if it's too thin and you really want a nice, rich, th thick stew, you kind of screw it. Oh, sorry. 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 Kitchen talk. Beep. Beep. Okay, bring it on in. Okay, so here I'm taking that flour and you can see it's sucking up all that juice and, and the fat. How much flour would you say that is? Well, I would probably say that's about uh, half a cup. But don't be afraid. Because what you want to do is you want to add enough where you can see that it, it's dried out, but it hasn't, you know, uh, the, the fat is gone. See how it's nice and like kind of rich? Now, what you're going to do is you're going to cook that flour. You're going to cook it by just sauteing it and moving around. If you look at the bottom of your pan, you'll start getting a font. A font is all those little crusts and all that. But what we're doing right now is we're cooking that flour so that way it doesn't taste like raw flour. So we're going to let it sit. And then our next point of business is adding our red wine. 
and it'll thicken it. It'll really become nice and thick. And then we'll add a little bit of beef stock to it. Now the beef stock, listen, if you do the collagen, it's fine. It, it's, it's a good product. What I would suggest is you possibly don't get the one that is uh, salted, get the unsalted one. Now, speaking of salt, every part that you go, you wanna add, we didn't season it when the bacon was in there, only because we don't want it to become too salty. If you're making a lobster stock, or if you're making a shrimp stock, if you're doing that, there's a natural salt that's within shrimp, lobster, that you don't wanna add a lot of salt to it. But always add just a little bit because it, it's called a layering of flavors. If you cook a potato in water and you don't have salt in your water, the potato will never taste salted. It'll taste bland. So every time that you're, 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 you're cooking, you want to add a touch of salt and a little bit of pepper. So that way it, it, it get, builds in flavor and it builds the, the different textures and, and uh, the vibrancy of the dish. I find that when uh, kids today, they don't add enough salt. Uh, it's called uninspired cooking. So you see, it's all become nice and rich. You got nice little goo to it. I think we're gonna add just the rest of the flour, cook it for about three minutes, and then we're ready to deglaze. Now deglazing can be done with wine, it can be done with red wine, white wine, it can be done with stocks, it could be done with fume, which is a white wine fish stock. But what we're gonna do is deglaze that so that way that font that's on the bottom, that crisp and brown and goldenness, will actually, you'll be able to scrape that up. And then once again, that adds more flavor. So you see, it's not black, it's not burnt. It's just that nice brown crispiness to it, okay? So we're ready. So I added about half a bottle. And that bottle goes for about 20 bucks at the state store. Did you say half a bottle? Half a bottle. Some of us have to work tomorrow, you know. <laughs> it's all going to be cooked out. Hey, you. Maybe, maybe a little bit more because I don't have to. Oh, sorry. Come on in. Now. You see how it's nice and thick now? You want to constantly move it and kind of like make sure it doesn't stick on the bottom, but that's going to be our nice thick jus. We've added a good amount of red wine to it and we'll finish a little bit of red wine at the end too. So at this point, we're taking the beef and you see what happens with the beef, all that jus release from it too, all that, that uh, glaze. So we're going to pour that in there. Can you see ours? Huh? Can you see ours? No, you probably can't. Hold on here. Uh, no, I can't. Let me see. Wait, here we go. Ours doesn't look like yours. That looks really good, though. You're doing something right. <laughs> did you put the red wine in there? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah we did. It's like grapes. That's great. <laughs> or flour. That's what ours looks like. That's awesome. You guys put the tomato paste in, didn't you? No. no not, yet. not yet. Are we not supposed yet. to? No, 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 no. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Right. Melissa, ours looks like yours. A lot soupier. Lots of lots of time. Yeah, the whole thing is you want it to be, like I said, you want it to be somewhat thick because at, at the end of the day, if it's too thin, it's still going to taste great. Listen, it's still going to be fantastic. I am. Dave. It's personal preference. Dave, the flour, did you say, did you say two tablespoons or two cups of flour? I would say a cup of flour and just make sure you cook it with that veg so it's the flour is cooked out of it. Okay. Okay. So a cup. cup. Yolanda, it's not two cups, is it? No. Oh, not one, two cup. Cups. one cup. One cup. One cup. One cup. One cup. Okay. Now, you see the beef is now in. The wine. Go give me. I need the liquid. Whatever the liquid is next. I'm following you. Oh, don't follow you. 
Now I'm going to cheat a little bit. I brought some beef stock home with me from the restaurant. But, but like I said, you can cheater, use cheater, 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 cheater. I know, I know. Well, I don't want you guys want to come to the restaurant. <laughs> but they can use. But it the smells collagen, good. The collagen is just fantastic. You can use that. You can oh, use that? that collagen beef stock. Get the one, but this is like gold. Oh. And now we're adding the beef stock? Yep. Okay. After the flour's cooked, then you're adding your beef stock and a thing called bouquet garni. Now, bouquet garni oh. is just a sachet. Oh, oh. sorry. Oh, you got to right. add the beef stock. No. They did not have that. They did not have that. So, a bouquet garni is just bay leaf, thyme, and parsley. And I put it in like a little sash like this. So that way I don't have to uh, pick out like the individual's time stems and all that. But take a look in here. But what if they don't have that? I think it was in the last one. We don't, we don't have that. You don't have time? You don't have bouquet garni? There you go, bay leaf. <laughs> you got it. Bay leaf, thyme, parsley, um, all in this. like a little. Just throw it in there? How many leaves? Yep. Just throw it in. How many? Uh, throw in uh, two bay leaves. And a uh, couple of raises of time and some parsley. Why didn't you tell us that first, David? Two yes. Leaves. Put like five in there. <laughs> five? Then you got then you got gumbo. Wait, so I love good gumbo though. All right. So look at the consistency of this. How much beef broth? Well, anyway. <laughs> Enough oh, yeah. to cover everything. Uh, you want to be able to cover the, the whole stew. But add a little, add some, take a look at it, add a little bit more. Remember, it's going to be cooking for two hours. So, but you don't want to do too much because then you're going to have a soup. Okay. So take a look here. You see this? This is what you should be looking like with the flat, with the roux that we made and the beef stock. That's what it should be looking like. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now, throwing them in. I'm sorry, David. One other question. We have not touched uh, the tomato paste or garlic yet, right? <laughs> Uh, well, the garlic went in with the onion, but that's okay. okay. Don't, worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're Crap. good. Go figure. Listen, you know what you can do? Take a little saute pan and just saute your garlic and add it to it. It's fine. Okay? Because it's going to be cooking for a long period of time. And then tomato paste. We add cognac. Yeah! <laughs> I love cognac. Somebody just said we, uh, we added cognac, and I said, that's a good one. Shall we go over here? Yep. So, <laughs> as my arms are about to fall off. Okay. Is it time so, for the paste yet? I'm sorry? Is it time for the paste yet? The tomato paste? That's everyone's asking. That you can add a little bit of tomato paste at the very end before, after you add your red wine, your beef stock, add about a half a tablespoon and just stir it in there. Now, what tomato paste does, it adds uh, a little bit of acid to it and it helps break down the meat by macerating it as it cooks, but then it also gives it a little bit of body to it. Okay. okay? Now, the pearl onions I told you about that I cheated and roasted ahead of time, I throw that right in. Okay? Oh, wow. What? That looks delicious. <laughs> oh, looks almost like I know what I'm doing. So, David, sorry, another cooking for idiots. The pearl onions I put in with the regular onions because I hadn't roasted them. Is that That's okay? Fine. That's fine. Now, the reason why I roast it in a separate, uh, in the oven, is I like it when they're nice and brown and caramelized all the way around. I find that when you saute them, you don't get that. They start to break down. They start to break apart. I like to have a whole onion that is nice and, and full and, and stays together, but it's brown all on the outside. How's your sous chef doing? Is he doing okay? Yes, I love it. We're kicking ass over here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, uh, we're back to where we we have it on the stove. Can you see? It's all incorporated. Now, it's finally time to take it down to low. Okay? Take it down to a low simmer. And like I said, if you want to do this where you're not worried about it burning and you're not worried and, you know, you're not around the house, put it in an oven. You could do 325 for uh, two hours, 
Um, or you can even go lower. You could do four hours at like 250. The slower it goes, the more tender the meat will be. If you go high on these, these you have to remember the, the type of meat that we're using. It's a part of the animal that works. Like a tenderloin is right in the middle of the back. It doesn't move. That's the reason why it's so tender. And all it does is build up fat. But we're using a shoulder or we're using a chuck where it's constantly moving. It's walking. And as that muscle develops and because of the stress that goes on it, that's what makes it tough. So the way you make it tender is you do it real low and slow. You saute it and then you braise for a long period of time at a low temperature. Right? Eight o'clock. Okay, so we're gonna take it out. Now how I did it, I did it in my oven. So I'm gonna take it out and then we're gonna show you, uh, I'm hoping that it's not. Oh, you want to? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. My sous chef is going to take it out. Now, for me, you know, there's David, a couple different. Oh, I'm sorry. David, did you answer? I, I saw there were a couple of questions in the chat about the bouillon cube. A bouillon cube? Yeah, people asked if, the, I guess they were saying, could they put that in there? Yeah, they can. Just be careful because bouillon cubes have such a, a high salt content. So really make sure that you're, you know, really thinning it out. You can use a bouillon cube, but honestly, that collagen is just, it, it, it's a good stuff. So now this is the one that we've been cooking for, for it's now three hours. I did it at a lower temperature. I did it at a slower temperature and a longer time. Oh gosh, <laughs> oh boy. Okay. I can't see what they're saying. Can you see? No, I can't. It's up in here. It's in this corner. Now, you see, I have my sachet in there uh, of the uh, feet of the uh, bouquet garni. We're going to take that out. But lift it up. Oh. You'll see it turned velvety. Um, and people say, oh, well, how do you know if it's done or not? I tasted this about uh, 40 minutes ago and the meat was there, but the potatoes needed just a touch longer. But you see that consistency? It's not like thin soup, but it's a nice thick. That can go over mashed potatoes. That could go over rice. It could go over uh, pasta. It could have that noodles. noodles. Egg noodles. Egg noodles. That's how you love yeah, it. Yeah, I do. All right. So, but what we're gonna be doing with it tonight, we're gonna to do a, a, a classic baguette. And on the side, since I put all that vegetables into it, we're gonna do like a, a, a triple cream that we're gonna smear on the bread when it's warm. This is uh, something like a Delice de Bourgogne, which is a triple cream from, uh, from France, but uh, you smear that on the baguette and then you dip the baguette into this. Woo! Oh dear. Now, I did some fresh chopped parsley at the end, because this is gonna add a little bit of freshness to it. It's gonna make it a little bit more uh, 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 fresh, but also have a little bit of that fresh, beautiful Italian herb to it. To the French. What's that? To the French dish. Yeah. The French took uh, everything from everybody yes. and made it their own. Yes. Do you wanna take it up? You got to work out today. Yeah. I'm serving that is. And then some fresh parsley over top. Baguette. And voila. That's a winter meal. Bon appetit. Very nice, Thank Julia. you. Very Thank nice. you. Thank you. Okay? Eight o'clock. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>